So for today's exploration, we have our first talk is gonna be by Chris. He's a graduate student in physics that will be talking about quantum computing. And then our second talk today will be by Matt. Uh, he's a graduate student in molecular biophysics and he's gonna be talking to you about science illustration. Thanks Shannon for the introduction. Hello everyone, uh, as Shannon said, my name's Chris and I'm a PhD student uh, in physics at Yale. Um, and I'm very excited to be here to talk to you all today a little bit about quantum computing. Um, so before I get started, uh, I'm just curious, how many of you have heard of quantum computing in the media or in some way, shape or form? Can you just type in the chat, yes or no? Okay, so there's a good balance of yes or no. Again, as I said, there has been a lot of media coverage lately, um, but hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have a better idea about what a quantum computer is. But before I get into that, I just wanna give a brief uh, background about how I got to where I am today. So I grew up not too far from here in the Bronx actually. Um, and here's a photo of me from I think the first grade all the way on the right. And I'd always been interested in science from a very young age. Um, and so by the time I got to college, um, I stayed pretty close to home and I started at the City, Uni City University of New York at Hunter College where I uh, worked in renewable energy um, in doing fuel cell research. Uh, I think I was always very curious. And so uh, as I finished one year, I started to this, I decided I wanted to explore other things. And so for a variety of reasons, I transferred to the University of Pennsylvania where I transitioned to working in medical physics, specifically trying to use physics to improve radiation therapy techniques. Um, after three more years there, I got my degree in physics and it was time to go to graduate school. And I think I was still curious at that point uh, and wanted to learn more about different things. And so having knowing, knowing nothing about quantum computing, I took a leap and started a PhD here at Yale where quantum computing is the primary focus of that research. Um, so that's a little bit about me. And so now we can get into quantum computing. But before we, I tell you about quantum computing, I think it's useful to sort of talk about computing that's not quantum. Um, and so what I wanna start with is just open the floor for suggestions for what are some examples of computer. If you could just put in the chat to you, if you hear computer, what do you think? Yeah, a Mac, Apple is certainly very dominant. Apple, yeah, Dell, HP, Chrome, yeah. So these are all good answers. Um, when I was younger, to me, what a computer was, was sort of a desktop. It was sort of clunky, there were a bunch of parts, there was a computer, but then a monitor and a keyboard. Um, and this is what I had growing up. And it wasn't until college that I actually got a laptop, which maybe many of you have. Um, okay, so these are computers, but they're not the only computers out there. Phones, smartphones are also computers. They can do a lot of the same things that uh, your laptop can, but even things like gaming PCs and consoles. So there's a PS4 for those of you um, that are into gaming. And so what do computers do? Uh, they do all the things that I said, you know, maybe most popularly for all of you, you use them to browse the internet. If you're into video games, you'll use them to game in some way. Uh, but then it's, you know, within social media, making, watching videos, but also for school, they can be useful for helping to do your math homework, for instance, and, and so much more. It's like computers are so ubiquitous in our lives today. And so I want to take a moment and uh, explain a little bit about how all of these computers work um, at, at a very low level. And so basically what all computers are doing is that they're processing bits. And so what a bit is, is just a thing that has two values. And in computers, that's either zero or one. And so I wanna give a quick example of how a computer can take things that are made up of zeros and ones and do something with it. So the simplest thing is maybe we can add two numbers. And so one way that you can break down numbers, say zero through eight, uh, into zeros and ones is like so. This is sort of called the binary way of writing numbers. And so for addition, if you wanna do say four plus seven, you know, for most of us, maybe that's, we can just do that in our head. It's easy, four plus seven. But if you ask a computer to do four plus seven, what it actually has to do is to break that four and that seven down into zeros and ones, and then do manipulations or operations on zeros and ones. 
And so binary addition is very similar to regular addition. You know, zero plus zero is zero, zero plus one is one. It's just special that one plus one brings you back to zero. Uh, and then you carry the one in this case, for instance. Okay, this is a very simple example of how a computer can do something simple like addition, but this is really the building block for all of computers. And so you can really represent anything you want, colors, numbers, letters, music, sound, all in terms of zeros and ones. And if you want to ever do anything with it on your computer, uh, it's always what it's going to do is it's going to process those zeros and ones um, in order to you know make a movie or show you a picture. In all of the computers that I listed before, uh, maybe you've seen some of these get taken apart, but they always have some sort of chip in them. And basically the zeros and ones in all your computers are electrical signals. And you can think of them as a switch. They're very, very small, but a switch being open is a zero and a switch being closed is a one. And so that's really how all of modern computers uh, work at the low level. Okay, so now we can sort of uh, maybe take a step back in history, but also just kind of look at how far we've come with computers and how powerful they really are. So if we go back about 50 years, this is a picture of the first computer that guided the mission that took the first human to the moon. It's very small, it's kind of clunky, it definitely looks retro and old school, but we've come a long way from that. And so maybe all of you have smartphones now. Uh, I have an iPhone 10. Um, and they're very popular. Uh, as we said before, these are all examples of computers. Um, but also what's, we can ask, you know, what's the biggest computer and most powerful computer we have in the world today? And the answer is, at least right now, it's the IBM Summit super, supercomputer. It's a computer that literally takes up an entire wa warehouse and is super, super massive. And so if we wanna ask the question, how good are these computers? How powerful are these computers? Uh, I have a question for y'all, which is how might we determine how fast a computer is if you wanted to say, compare these three computers? Using the specs, definitely. Code, checking the latency, seeing how big the motherboard is, boot time. Yeah, these are all really great answers. And in short, there's not one way to compare computers, but uh, for the purposes of say, seeing how fast it is, one way that you can use it is by counting the what's called floating point operations per second or flops for short. Basically a flop is like a small math problem. It's addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division, uh, and is really the basic unit uh, building block for computing things. And so I wanna go through these three computers and have you guess how many flops each of these runs at. So do we have any guesses for the Apollo computer? How many flops do we think it has or it was capable of 50 years ago? A hundred, a thousand, 300, 20. Yeah, these are, these are reasonable numbers. Uh, you would think 50 years ago, it's maybe not that fast. So hundreds to thousands. Turns out it was actually pretty good. It was about 14,000, which for 50 years ago on a hunky machine like that is pretty impressive. And so that's that's great. Like computers were really, really powerful even 50 years ago. How about for the iPhone 10? Do we have any guesses for the iPhone 10? 200K, 1,000, 100,000, 500K, 100K, 50,000K. Yeah, so the numbers are getting a little bit bigger. Um, a million. It turns out it's it's really, really good. It's 325 billion. And so this is a huge jump from 50 years ago. And if you want in scientific notation, that's 10 to the 11. It's really, really fast. And this is how your iPhone can handle doing all of the things uh, it does uh, when you're, say, multitasking. Okay, how about the Summit IBM supercomputer? What's our guesses for that? Six septillion, a trillion numbers that I don't even know. Yeah, uh, to, the answer is 200 million billion or 200 exaflops. I didn't even know exa was a thing, but you get the idea now. And in scientific notation, it's about 10 to the 20. Um, and that's, that's really ridiculous. I mean, I don't even, I can't even get my head around that number. It's just so large and so powerful, but 
if you think about it, if our iPhone, just one iPhone that fits in our hand has the capacity of 325 billion, then the supercomputer, which is like, you know, thousands of these large machines in a whole warehouse, maybe it's not super surprising. Okay, and so if there's any math problem we want to do, surely the IBM supercomputer can do it. And it turns out that's not always true. Um, and so let's just take a very simple example and finding the prime factors of integers. So can anyone tell me what the two prime factors of 21 are? Eleven, seven, and three, three and seven. Yeah, great. That's the answer. It's three and seven. Uh, it wasn't too hard for us to just think like, oh, okay, well, what is it? Uh, three times seven, and there's not anything else it could be. And so for us, when the number's small, it's it's not too hard. Can anyone tell me the two prime factors of this number? No. Good answer, no, because I couldn't do either because it's just way too large to be able to do in your head or even with pen and paper. But turns out your computer can. If you asked your laptop what the two prime factors of this numbers are, it would give you the answer. And in this case, it's these two numbers uh, and their prime numbers you can check. However, uh, this can't keep going on forever. If the number gets really, really, really large, even the IBM Sub Summit supercomputer wouldn't be able to tell you the answer. It just couldn't solve this problem. Um, and so even supercomputers have their limits. And so this is where quantum computers enter. It turns out that people have shown that if you did have this thing called a quantum computer and it was large enough, it could actually solve this problem. We're not there yet, uh, but in principle it could. Now you might say, okay, well, Chris, that's not interesting. Why do I care about finding two prime factors of large numbers? That sounds like a really stupid math homework problem. Well, it turns out it's a really important problem because the reason why all of your passwords and your banking information and your credit card information is safe when you go online and use it is because this problem is hard to solve. You know the password, meaning you know the private key. For instance, you know the two large prime numbers, but if you put the, key, the product of those, like this large prime number out in the world, then you know, no, one could, no one could figure out the answer. And so because no computer in the world can solve this problem, that means that in general, if you don't know the password, you're safe and no one can steal your information. And so that's why this, uh, this problem, even though it seems silly, is very important in the grand scheme of things. And this is the main reason why interest in quantum computers uh, really emerged about two decades ago. Now, this is not the only thing a quantum computer can do. There are other general broad applications uh, which would help, you know, general things like drug design and optimization for businesses. And so there are many things that this quantum computer could be useful for that current computers can't do. However, it's also important to note that a quantum computer is not going to do everything for us. For instance, it's not going to replace our phones and laptops, and it's not going to make the internet faster. It's only going to make certain problems, which have these very specific applications, tractable when they otherwise weren't. But in terms of browsing the internet, you know, I think our iPhones and our laptops, they're plenty fast already, and it's already, you know, we don't need to make it so much more faster. Okay, great. So now hopefully you have a bit of an idea of what a quantum computer can be used for. Um, so now you can ask, well, what does it look like? And unlike a normal computer where I could always bring out a chip of some sort, and it's usually Intel, and say at, a, at the heart of every computer is some motherboard and some chip, um, for a quantum computer, it's less clear. And there are many different ways that researchers around the world are trying to build a quantum computer. And here I'm only highlighting a few ways. Uh, on the left is a picture of a trapped ion quantum computer. So here, instead of the zeros and ones being voltage or electrical signals on these chips, there are two different quantum states of a single ion. In the middle is uh, you know, these optical waveguides where instead of ions, the zeros and ones are little particles of light called photons. And they can have two distinct states, either as you see here, being vertically or horizontally polarized. And then what I personally work with in the lab are these superconducting circuits, uh, which are maybe the closest to what you might see 
uh, like an Intel, you know, CPU chip look like in the top right here. The only caveat is that in order for these circuits to work, they have to be really, really, really cold. And so can anyone guess how cold that uh, this circuit needs to run at? And for reference, you can say some degrees Fahrenheit. And so what we're used to is between zero and 100. Zero is really cold and 100 is really hot. I'm getting a lot of ap near absolute zeros. Um, and that's absolutely right. If you wanted to put it on this scale, temperature scale in Fahrenheit, it's as close to zero as you can imagine, about negative 459 degrees Fahrenheit, or as many of you have said, very, very close to absolute zero if you were to express it in a term, in a unit called Kelvin. Okay, uh, great. So now we can see different ways that researchers are trying to build a quantum computer with things that aren't electrical switches in a motherboard. And there are different physical systems that you can use but what makes it different from the computers that we already have, like zeros and ones are just zeros and ones. Why does it matter that there are these ions or these photons instead of these electrical switches? Um, well, it turns out this is where the quantum part of it comes in. And the underlying principle that makes this possible is the idea of quantum superposition. So unlike an electrical switch, which is either open or closed, a quantum state or a quantum system that has two states, zero and one, can live in both of those states at the same time. And so this means if you have one quantum bit, which is the analog of a regular bit, which we'll just call a qubit for short, there will be two states that that one qubit can have, zero or one, or both zero and one. For two qubits, now if two of them can be zero and one at the same time, then you get all the possible combinations for those two qubits, which is two squared, which is four. You can keep going. For three, it's two cubed, and it's eight. And in general, maybe you're seeing the trend for n qubits, where n is a number. The number of states that you have is two to the n, which is exponential growth, which, as we might know, is very, very, very large. For context, if you had 300 of these qubits, you would have more states than there are atoms in the entire universe. And so this is really what exponential growth is for a number that's relatively small, like 300. You can really have a massive parallelism in the amount of data that you can process at the same time. Okay, well, 300 is not so bad. Uh, we, you might know that our you know, iPhones have billions and billions of little switches. So let's just make 300 of these quantum things and make it work. Um, turns out it's very hard. And it's not so easy because quantum states are very fragile and prone, prone to errors. So this is like if you were you know, trying to do a math problem on your quantum computer or your regular computer, and it would just give you the wrong answer most of the time. That's not very useful. We want a computer to work properly. And so the solution that the community is going to have to use is called error correction. And it turns out the way that it works uh, for quantum computers is that you need many, many, many physical qubits for one functioning qubit that can do the useful information processing that I talked about. And so just for context, you can ask, well, what's the biggest quantum computer the world has now? One example that's pretty close is Google has a chip that has about 53 physical qubits. But we know that we might need hundreds to thousands of these just even for one of them to work. And so on one hand, it took researchers a lot of time and effort to get to 53 from nothing. Uh, but at the same time, there's a really, really large gap between 53 and hundreds or even thousands or hundreds of thousands. Um, and so with that, uh, I will end and open the floor for any questions. And thank you for your attention. Hey, um, Chris. Hi. So let me ask you some of the questions we've collected. I would like to actually take the opportunity and cheat and ask you a question I have 
Sure. Um, one of my absolute favorite video games uses this. It's a science fiction game. It uses the conceit of using what they call quantum entanglement to do long distance communication, like the idea of changing these qubits over distance. Mm -hmm. how, how, how unbelievably unfeasible is this? Um, <laughs> so it's not as unfeasible as you might think. Uh, many researchers have done things like taken light sources uh, from satellites. So, sorry, for context, uh, I think what the question is referring to is there's this thing called quantum entanglement, where no matter how far apart two uh, qubits are, if they're entangled, then they sort of share this inherent link. And so what researchers have done is they've shot, you know, little particles of light from uh, the International Space Station to two different places on the Earth that are maybe, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles apart. Um, and measured that they are entangled. And so uh, the idea of using that as a resource moving forward to communicate qubits from one place to another uh, is actually not as crazy uh, as it might sound. Thank you. And now from our actual audience, um, there was some discussion about kind of like competition between these two, two entities that make groups of computers. So what who's sort of winning this race to make the best smartest computer is it like ibm google microsoft it's a great question all of those companies are certainly in the game and many 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 startup companies are also getting in the game i think at this point it's kind of like a very it's like if a tortoise and a hare had to race but the race was like to go around the world and so like on one hand, maybe you would say the hair would win, and in this case, that might be Google or a few others. But at the same time, you want to go around the world, and like you're not even sure if you can do that. And so I think uh, this is why quantum computing is in a very interesting position, being between research and industry, where there is a race, but there's still fundamental questions about what the best way to build one is, uh, that's not universally agreed upon. Great. And then um, one final question. What, I guess, hmm, how, what, what are, what are, what's like the, I guess, the most important problem we're trying to solve that we need to get a bigger and better computer to do so? Right. Um, so, you need two things to happen if you want a big quantum computer that works. One, as I highlighted here at the end, uh, you need to correct the errors that happen because quantum states are very fragile. On the other hand, you need to scale up. You need to put more qubits in a system and make them work together. And so I think the industry and startup companies where they might differ in their approaches is if they try to scale up first and then beat the errors down, or if you want to beat the errors down in a small system first and then scale up. And so I think both of these are going to have to work together in tandem moving forward. And those are the two most important things um, that need to be addressed. Thank you so much. This is all really interesting. And I think probably there'll be more questions for you even uh, afterwards. Sure, to thank you, on. everyone. We're going to listen to another great talk. This one's by Matt, and he's going to talk about um, where art meets science and the importance of art in science and how we talk about it. Uh, just a quick reminder, um, when we're using the chat, we want to make sure that we're on topic with the science. You guys did a great job with the last talk, so let's just keep that up. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I'm guessing we probably have most everybody back now, so I'm going to start getting into things. And it seems like we have a lot of new people this week, which is really, really exciting. Um, but for those who have been with us for a while, or just for those who saw this most recent talk, um, this one that I'm going to give is a little, little bit different. So it's still about science, but obviously from my title, I'm going to talk about art and science. So a little bit about me to begin. Uh, so I'm a biologist, and I study viruses. 
here is one virus that I study, and in chat, I would like people to guess what virus this is. Okay, starting to see some guesses. E. coli, the flu, COVID-19, flu. This is a pretty one, but I have no idea. Thanks, Grace. Bubonic plague. Okay. Looking like there are a lot of good guesses coming in. Um, so this is actually HIV, and it's the main virus that I study. But there's another one that I've been studying a bit more recently, and maybe this one will be recognized a bit more quickly. And that's this one in the lower left. So once again in chat, can people guess what that virus is? COVID, COVID, coronavirus, COVID, 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 corona. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think it's looking like this one is a little bit more recognizable. Um, now, what's interesting about these and what I'm gonna talk about in regards to them is that neither of these pictures are actually from data. They are not pictures of actual viruses, but it's taking a lot of information that we know about both of these viruses and putting them into a graphical format that we can all recognize. And so the HIV image is made by a really talented person in my field, Janet Iwasa, and she does a lot of cool images like this, as well as animations. Um, and this coronavirus image that a lot of us are kind of unfortunately pretty familiar with now um, was made by this team of scientists and artists from the CDC. And so these are cool, but they aren't real images of the viruses. And I kind of want to get into why we would not use these real images. Um, and so here we have a depiction of a couple scientists doing their thing in a lab, right? And boom, really exciting, they make some science. They figure something out, it's cool, they're excited. But the problem is that they're there inside their bubble, they're there in their lab, and if they learn something new, that's great for the scientists, but all the rest of us are out here in the world, we're doing our own thing, and if the science just stays in its bubble, just stays with the scientists, we can't do anything with it. So somehow, some way, we need to be able to get the science outside the lab to the rest of the world so that we can all appreciate the understanding that comes from it or do something with it that's useful. So this communication is really, really important. And with the whole title of my talk and my intro earlier, the particular form of communication that I'm gonna be talking about is science illustration. And it's the combination of art and science, which to me is usually two different things, right? So I think there's kind of a popular idea that people are either right-brained or left-brained, they're artistic or scientific, they're creative or they're rational. Um, but the problem is this isn't real. Not only is the biology bad, your brain doesn't work like that, but people really don't work like that, right? You can be both creative and rational. You can be artistic, you can be scientific, you can be neither of them and people are just fine like that too. This isn't real to how people work, and it really definitely is not real to how science should work. And it's kind of an example of that. If we go back in history, right, for early scientists, before we could take pictures of anything, if they're out in the field, they're biologists, they're trying to discover stuff, right? For whoever the biologist was that ran into these rhinoceros beetles and was trying to explain to other scientists as well as just people that, hey, there are bugs out there that have giant horns on their faces, and it's crazy, they can explain it as there are big bugs out there with horns on their faces, or they could draw it. And so for this scientist, it was really, really, really important that they were also an artist. I cannot draw this well, but I can tell that these are rhinoceros beetles from the picture that this person made, right? Now, they weren't always the best, right? We do also have some, some gems like this rhino that doesn't really look like a rhino I know from this time period too. But the point being that for a long time, before we could take pictures of things, scientists had to be artists, and artists were really important for science. But today we can take pictures, right? Today we can take pictures of things that we see out in the world, and we can use that to explain a lot of stuff, but science illustration is still really important. So over the course of exploring science, we've had a lot of talks about astronomy and things up in space. And here's an example of a science illustration of the formation of a solar system. Now this is really cool. And it's based on science that we know from looking up into the night sky and observing a lot of things. But we can put this together in one image, something that we couldn't do by taking a bunch of pictures up in the night sky. We get more details of things. We can see it all in one progression, even though 
time frame for this is way too long to see. And so science illustration is filling this void here in something where we can't take a picture of this, right? We have a lot of technology, but it's not technology that can do this. And you can think about this for a lot of other things too, right? You can think about dinosaurs, right? They aren't around anymore. We can't take pictures of them, but we can draw some really cool dinosaurs. Or if we want to look at like how arteries and veins work in the face, you can't take a picture of a person like this, but we can make an image. Or chemical reactions are way too small to see. We definitely can't take a picture of that. But we can draw something like this to explain what is happening in uh, a chemical reaction. And so all of these aren't just pretty pictures, right? Um, they are depictions of the science that we understand for these things, right? So I saw somebody right there say that technically dinosaurs are birds. And yeah, this picture here is including the scientific understanding that we have that birds or dinosaurs had feathers, right? And so science illustration isn't just making cool pictures, it's taking scientific understanding and then showing it in this drawn fashion. And you can have a range, right? You can be really artistic and pretty, you can make this dinosaur picture, or it can be pretty simple, you can make the chemical reaction picture. Yeah, dinosaurs had feathers. Um, but science illustration can do a lot of other things too, right? So here is a bacteria. This is E. coli. Some people guessed that earlier. earlier. And so we can take a picture of this thing, right? We have a good picture. This includes a lot of information. And I'm going to go ahead and draw your attention to this little black blob that's inside of the bacteria. Um, and the question I'm going to have for you is this black blob, which is its DNA, how much do you think it can move around in the cell? Is it just a little bit? It kind of stays in place. You scooch around. It can kind of like go up towards that end that it's closer to. Maybe you go a little bit further down towards that darker gray stuff. Or does it just bounce all over? What do we think? A lot. Probably can go all over. Can scooch around a lot. More or less. Scooch. Scooch. Bounce. Bounce all over a lot. Okay, all right. So there's, there seems to be a little bit of a range, but mostly on the side of scooching around or bouncing all over, right? And so, like I said, there is actually a lot of information that's in this picture, right? But it's maybe not information whose details are clear to us, right? So instead, if we have an art illustration, we can show the same kind of cell, and this time we've turned that black blob of DNA into these blue strands that are all over. And you can also see that there's a ton of other stuff that's around these blue strands, right? Lots of other things are packed into that cell. It is jam tight. And so the answer is going to be just a little bit, right? It's actually really tough for that black blob in this picture to move around. And if you were looking at this as a scientist, you could say that, you know, it is a darker gray inside that cell, and that tells you that there are more things there, and maybe that that means the black blob is going to have a tougher time moving around. So that information is in the picture, but I would say that it's definitely clear in the art illustration, right? It's definitely more obvious that there's a ton of stuff in there. And so that's another power there, right? You can show more details or highlight details. Um, and so once again, I've got a question for you. So we're, we're back into biology. We have another thing that I'm showing you on the screen. So the question is, what are the things in this picture? Thinky, 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 cells, Ebola, shells. They do look very shell-like, that's true. Cells, bacteria, cells, DNA, cells maybe. All right, all right, we have some good guesses coming in. All right, so here, before I give you the answer to that, I'm going to give you another thing, okay? And that's this picture. So once again, the question is, what is this thing? What is the thing on the right? Amperger shaped cells. I like that. Okay, thing on the right. Got a mitochondria. We've got a liver, mitochondria, sausage cell, mitochondria. Okay, okay. Steak. I think I saw that one earlier too. All right, so as, as these uh, answers continue to come in, the answer to both questions actually is that they're mitochondria. And so we had a lot of, at least a lot more guesses of mitochondria for 
this artistic depiction on the right than we did for the thing on the left. And so especially as you all are going to go on and learn more about biology, you'll, you'll run into mitochondria a lot. You've got that tagline of them being the powerhouse of the cell that I think I saw, right? And so the artists, when they're deciding to draw this mitochondria for you in the textbook, right, they've got all these fold things that are going on. You can see the folds in the image of the actual mitochondria. That's maybe what you thought, saw as like steak lines or if anybody saw it as a volleyball. Um, but they've also decided to do something that's basically just for an artistic sense, right? Because they're still artists. And they've drawn it with this bend in it, right? You can see that little bend in the side there. It makes it kind of look like a kidney bean, maybe. But you see that that bend isn't really in the mitochondria that we have in our picture. It isn't necessarily in real mitochondria. But a lot of artists, when they draw mitochondria in textbooks, are going to give it that little bend. And so even though it's not necessarily real to how mitochondria actually are, it gives us a consistent way of referring to mitochondria in our drawings, in our art. And so people, as they get used to what a mitochondria looks like in a textbook, they can see that this is a mitochondria. This is how we give pictures of it, right? Um, but this can also lead to some issues, right? When we're using our artistic sensibilities to try to explain science, there are room for errors, right? And so we're going to look at this picture. And so this is probably hopefully kind of clear to people. This is the idea of the evolution of humans, and it gives a lot of information that's true to the science that we understand, right? We understand that we probably, we, that we probably evolved from earlier ape ancestors that developed into standing on two legs, and eventually that led to humanity, right? Um, but there are a lot of people out there in the world where their understanding of evolution and where humans came from evolutionarily kind of stops at an image like this. And that can make a lot of problems. They can look at this and say that, mm, this doesn't seem right to me. This seems fake. Like, there are apes around today, right? Maybe that's an issue for them that, like, if we came from apes, that they're still around us. Like, maybe that's a problem. This sort of implies that there's a direction to things. Like, if you were an ape, like, eventually you're just going to grow up and become a human. Like, humans are a necessary end point of being an ape. And so this makes problems in that those sort of implications aren't really true to how we understand the science. And so even though this is a really cool way of showing evolution, maybe it's more interest or maybe it's more uh, straightforward and true if we show it as an evolutionary tree as we understand them to work. And we can see that there were a lot of different versions of human-like things that developed and then died out along the way to eventually making humans. Maybe that helps more people come to the understanding that evolution is a real thing, or they can see that chimpanzees, as opposed to being our ancestors, who are also alive today, are actually just kind of our cousins. And so there can be issues in how we decide to show our science illustrations that lead to people having issues understanding the science and coming to conclusions that aren't true. And so we do need to be careful there. And so there's a lot of thought that needs to go into making your science illustration. And so as last thing, let's look at a um, modern idea of that. OK. So one last question for all of y'all. So you have this graph here on the left-hand side. Do you all know what the point this graph is trying to make is? So I don't know, maybe it's tough to see some of the words, and that would probably help, right? Um, we've got, this is pointing to a pandemic outbreak. And these are both flattening the curve, COVID-19 graph of flattening the curve. What? COVID-19 cases. OK, OK. So there's some good guesses, right? So this is a graph on flattening the curve. This is a phrase that I had no idea what it was February of this year, and all of a sudden it's a phrase that I know very well because we're all living through coronavirus, right? And so on the right-hand side here, this is a picture showing the number of Google searches for the phrase flatten the curve, right? So you can see that it's spiking in early, mid-ish uh, March there. And at the same time, this purple graph now is occurrences of this picture here. Um, 
so the purple grab is uh, when journalists have decided to use this picture to help them explain to all of these people who are looking for what um, flattening the curve means to explain to them what flattening the curve is. Um, but we, what you can also see is that it's dropping off pretty quickly. Like there's a lot of people that are still searching for flattening the curve, but it's disappeared because what some of you had issues with early on, this is a pretty technical graph. Like this is not an easy thing. This is complicated. And so this graph gave way to GIFs like this, which are probably a little bit easier for people to appreciate and understand. There are things that simplify the information. Um, they just tell people what they need to know. And what you can see is that this is an improvement on the science illustration language that we're using. So it isn't even just something that's one and done. You're a science illustrator and you made a thing and you're cool. It's a continuing process of us understanding how to communicate with one another to convey scientific information to everybody. And it's really, really important because getting science out there is important for people working together to do things like fight a pandemic. And so as my last little note, science illustration is important. And as opposed to having two sides, you're either artistic or you're scientific, everything is a lot better if we just appreciate that that's not really true, the two work together. Um, and they're necessary for the advancement of both science and all of us in society. And so now I just want to know if you all have questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Matt. That was a great talk and a really important one, too. Um, even as a scientist myself, I sometimes forget about the role of art in science. It's really, really important. Um, and so one question we had, so now that we know that art is so important for science, um, what if you're a scientist and you can't draw? Like, are there other ways scientists engage with art? Definitely, definitely, yeah. So I am, I'm one of those examples of a scientist who cannot draw. I'm very bad at it, right? Um, but what's still important, right, even for me, right, when I can't do the art myself, is that I can communicate and explain to people that can do the art what it is that I know so that I can have somebody that's, that's, that's in between, right? Somebody that can help me explain the science that I know, um, explain it to everybody else that wants to know. And so it's good to have open lines of communication for me and somebody who can do both that science and that art thing. Yeah, great answer. I'm also not very good at drawing. Um, so there was a section in your talk about um, how some graphics could be maybe not representing the information the best way they could. Um, mm -hmm. For example, the one about evolution, and there was people, um, even when you showed that um, image, people were wondering, like, you know, how are the apes still here? Like, that is a good question when you look at an image like that. So um, I guess the question here is, um, are there, like, are there any illustrations that are just truly like misleading? Like, I don't think that one meant to be misleading, but are there some illustrations that are meant to be misleading? And how does that happen? Yeah, so certainly you could draw something with the intention of misleading the people that you're trying to communicate with. And that would not be a very ethical use of your science illustration powers, but it can't happen, right? And usually that's done by people who have some purpose, they have some that they, they, they want to motivate, and so maybe they make an image that kind of messes with the science a little bit, right? And so that's also part of the reason why it's important to have a big community of both scientists and science illustrators um, that can call into question when things don't actually match with the science or they don't match with how we think things actually are. That's a great answer, and I hope no one uses science illustrations to try to <laughs> do bad things, <laughs> but unfortunately it could still happen. Um, and so one last question um, for you. Um, so we talked a lot about how scientific art can be used for um, communicating to the public, but um, can you also think about scientific art as, for example, um, in engineering, like the drawings and the sketches that you do for buildings? Is that also a type of scientific art? And how is that important for scientific illustration in general? Certainly, yeah. So the science illustration as a whole can actually be really, really broad, right? And it's important to have a bunch of different aspects available to you. Um, if you are in the job of a science illustrator, you tend to be a person that makes more of the graphical art designs, like I showed with the, the picture of viruses or maybe the picture of the dinosaur. 
Um, but it's still scientific illustration if you're trying to show your, your engineering thing, your diagram, um, or just your scientific knowledge in some sort of way that's, that's, that's visual, right? And so for some people, you're, if you're a science illustrator, you're, you're drawing things right, but you also are going to have some people that are going to help you make graphs that are better at communicating or making diagrams that are better at communicating. And all this is going to come back to that communication is really, really important. If you're a scientist or an engineer, nothing comes from you having that knowledge or that expertise if you can't explain it to other people and work with one another. That's a great answer. So for all of you guys who are interested in art and maybe also interested in science, maybe there's lots of ways you can engage with the scientist, um, the scientists and the artistic community at the same time. Um, and so um, any other questions, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure to have Matt answer them after and that'll be sent to you in the Q&A, just like Heather said earlier. Thanks everybody. So we're back with our speakers from um, our Exploring Science today. We had some great talks about quantum computing and science illustration. So we're just gonna get to the questions we couldn't get to during our event. So uh, Chris, we had a few follow-up questions for you about quantum computing. And so the first one was kind of about quantum computers in general. So what are you using to make these quantum computers? And once you make them, how big are they? Yeah, that's a great question. So as I tried to highlight in my talk, there's not just one way that researchers are trying to build a quantum computer. Um, that's sort of part of this interesting like race because no one's sure which technology will win. The one that I personally work with uh, uses superconducting circuits. So this is usually some superconducting material. Uh, most commonly it's aluminum that's patterned on thin substrates that are typically either sapphire or silicon. Um, and that is what makes up the architecture for a superconducting based quantum computer. But other kinds of quantum computers, for instance, like trapped ions, looks very different. So in that case, you're actually using a lot of lasers and electric fields to levitate single ions in a vacuum chamber. And so in that case, uh, it's not you know, a ton of electronics in this dilution refrigerator, but just a big vacuum chamber um, that holds these qubits in the form of single trapped ions. Um, and there are a ton more, uh, which I think are very interesting, but maybe the most, the one of the coolest ones uh, are nitrogen vacancy centers. So if you ever take a piece of diamond, there are naturally occurring defects in diamond. And it turns out that you can find these defects in diamond, honestly, even probably in you know, a wedding ring that you might have around. Um, and a defect uh, leaves, for instance, one unpaired electron that can be used as a qubit. So this just goes to show that there are many, many different platforms that people are trying to make a quantum computer with. And depending on the platform, then the corresponding size will uh, be different. And so the size of a dilution refrigerator for the superconducting stuff might be you know, the size of a small room, um, but a vacuum chamber might be even larger or smaller depending on the technology. So the answer to how big one a quantum computer might be would definitely depend on uh, the type of implementation uh, that it's used. Cool. So maybe you can make old wedding rings into quantum computers one day? Maybe. Awesome. Cool. So some of those things sound like things I've heard in in normal computers like silicon chips. I've heard of those before. Uh, so can we combine our quantum computers, maybe if we make them out of those kind of materials with our normal computers? Yeah, certainly. Um, and this sort of gets to a more general point, which is, you know, it's very hard to build a quantum computer. And the challenge is making one that works and that is big enough. And so certainly we don't want to use any of the resources in the quantum computer for it to do any computation that is easy for a regular computer. And so ultimately, uh, when we do have a quantum computer, you can certainly bet that it will need to interface with a regular computer and that the problems that we wanna solve will only use the quantum computer for the parts that are hard to do on the regular computer. But for everything else, uh, if the regular computer is good enough, then we'll certainly use those resources. So 100%, uh, the first useful quantum computer will definitely be integrated with uh, a normal, probably supercomputer. Cool, awesome. So that leads to another uh, couple questions we had. 
about what quantum computers are kind of useful for. And someone asked about that really, really big number you showed. Um, it seemed to me kind of just like a random, really large number, but you said it had two uh, prime factors. So how did you come up with that number and how do you know that it had two prime factors? Yeah, so uh, that number I actually pulled from the internet, um, but generally speaking, uh, so that number was from RSA, which is sort of the general um, organization that deals with uh, these uh, privacy uh, considerations. And so for context, the reason why that problem was interesting is because the way that we can keep passwords safe uh, is because at the very heart of it, if you wanted to hack into someone's computer or bank account, uh, you get a public key, like anyone can access kind of like a public key, which would be like that large number. But in order to break in, you would need to know the two prime factors. And so because that was hard, that's a hard problem to do uh, on a regular computer, um, you can be sure that your information will be safe. Um, that requires sort of this asymmetry. Like if you know the uh, large number with two prime factors, it's hard to find those two prime factors. But it's easy if you know two really large prime numbers to multiply them to get together to make the key. And that asymmetry is exactly why you can just come up with a password in the, on the top of your head, uh, and the, the you know the computer will automatically generate uh, the encryption such that when you put that information out there, not everyone can can access it. Um, and it turns out that even though it might not seem like it, it's actually rather easy to come up with a large prime number. The algorithm that you use in order to make those numbers is pretty cheap um, in terms of computation time. And so that's why anyone can sort of just, you know, come up with a random password. Computer does a relatively simple task of generating, uh, you know, two large prime numbers to multiply together to send out that um, public key into the world. Nice. So then if a quantum computer can find that much easier than a normal computer, will all of our privacy and passwords be ruined once we have a quantum computer? <laughs> so if we magically just had a quantum computer like right in this moment and it just appeared, yes, it would be able to really create total chaos uh, in the financial world and just really everything else on the internet. It would basically break the internet. Um, however, we know that a quantum computer is, is really far away. Um, and so by the time we have quantum computers, we will probably, the government more specifically, uh, will be adopting using those quantum computers to come up with new ways that are quantum encrypted instead of regular encrypted in ways that not even a quantum computer could break. Um, so right now, uh, there are really, it's, it's interesting, there are even just like open calls for people anywhere to just submit these algorithms that could be run on a quantum computer uh, so that the government can ultimately end up making an informed decision on picking uh, the most secure one by the time quantum computers get here. So it'll definitely be a slow transition rather than like a hard, uh, hard line. So we're already working on new ways to keep our data safe even before the quantum computer is here. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Cool. Well, that was all of our questions, but thanks so much. We got a lot of interest, and I know in the breakout rooms had some great discussions about quantum computing and quantum physics, too. So. Yeah, great. Thanks for asking the questions. A lot of fun. Yeah, I always find the quantum computers really cool. Um, I still don't understand much about them, but it is good to know that the government is thinking ahead um, in terms of getting some algorithms figured out. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so we also had a really awesome presentation from Matt about science illustration and why that's important. Um, and so one of the one of the questions that came up, Matt, that I thought was really interesting was, um, so is if the art's not like exactly, uh, you know, capturing what the science is that it's trying to depict, is that like false advertising or false education, educating, for instance? you showed towards the end of your talk the two pictures that were related to evolution. One seemed a lot simpler, but was definitely misleading in some ways, but the other seemed so complicated that you might not be able to take anything away from it. So can you talk about the sort of balance there and is it false advertising or how does that work? Yeah, so I think that's a really big consideration that has to be taken into account when people are making scientific illustrations. And it's something that's probably more of a challenge than you encounter in, in art 
more in general, right? Like usually you do have some kind of message that people are trying to communicate when they're making art of any kind. Um, but with scientific art in particular, the the answer, the thing that you're trying to communicate is is kind of set in stone, right? It's set in the facts that we know about the scientific world. And so if your science illustration that you've made, even if you haven't intended it to be so, if it's not accurately commuting the communicating the truth that we've found through science, then it's not really doing its job. So it's not it's not good science illustration and science illustrators have to be very careful about that. And they usually go through a lot of steps of making sure that what they've done does what they want it to do. I see. But maybe there are some times where it's not such a big deal, like the mitochondria and the kidney being shaped, right? But sometimes I guess it could be a worse deal, right? Yeah, yeah. There are definitely some things that like a little inaccuracy that can slide, right? If it's for the sake of being able to better communicate the, the things that are important, um, then we can survive that, right? If we get so bogged down in the details, because you can go down a huge rabbit hole of all of the things that we have learned in science to be really, really, really accurate, but that can also lose your message in all of that noise. So it is, it's a balancing act between those two sides. And sometimes, sometimes it's okay to show your mitochondria as kidney beans, as long as everybody realizes that those are mitochondria. I see. That makes sense. Yeah. Sometimes you have to, it's just not possible to, to depict everything in order to be sensible. You have to, sometimes less is more, even if it's not perfectly scientifically accurate. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I think there were questions during your talk about, uh, or you definitely alluded to the fact that biologists back in the day had to be good illustrators. Um, but you did say that, you know, you can't draw very well. I can't draw very well. So you don't have to be a good illustrator anymore to be a scientist. But what about the reverse direction? Um, do you have to be a scientist to be a science illustrator? How does that work? So I, I will say that a lot of science illustrators have a good background in science. It's really, really helpful um, to be able to come into whatever scientific field that you're going to help by making your illustration. If you have some understanding of how that field works, some of the basic facts behind it, um, so you have a, a good basis to work up from so that when you're talking with the scientists that you're going to talk with in the field, because they're the experts and they're specialized, um, you can more easily get to these are the things that we want to show or you can understand um, what the, the scientists are telling you. Um, so you don't have to be a really specialized scientist. You don't have to know all of the ins and outs of the field that you're going to make an illustration for. Um, but usually you do have to have like a pretty good, a good background in science to be a really, really good science illustrator. It takes out some of the, the gray area um, that could be there if you're coming purely from an artistic standpoint. That makes sense. Just sort of meeting people in the middle, sort of. Um, so you talked a lot about science illustration, the pros and cons of it, why it's important. And you mentioned that you're in, in the uh, virology field. So can you talk maybe about um, a graphic that you've made recently that you're really proud of, or maybe one in general that you've made that you, you think you really succeeded in getting your message across? Yeah, yeah, actually. So my field is a little bit interesting in that we focus a lot on what we can sort of visually see and demonstrate. So like I said, I work with viruses, and in particular, I look at the little tiny pieces of the viruses that end up making the whole. So if you can think back to the uh, coronavirus image, right? Um, and the popular pictures that we have out in the media, um, it's usually like a little gray ball and it's got these like red spiky things sticking up from the surface. Um, so those red spiky things are one small part of coronavirus. And one thing that we've done is we have figured out in really, really fine detail what those red spiky things look like. And so I can take this data that we found and move it into a computer program and show it as sort of a graphical thing. And we can sort of like zoom around this a uh, graphical 3D depiction of this spiky thing that comes out of the coronavirus to look at some of the, the details that help it stay together or do its job. And that can give us a little bit of information about how it works, how the coronavirus is so um, infectious and so stuff like that. Um, I'd say it's a cooler graphic that, that I have put together. It's, it's all animated and it follows along with how I want to talk about it. So I think that's cool, but it's probably not something that a general audience would be like, yeah, that's really exciting. But for me, it's good. 
but it sounds like, you know, since a lot of scientists are working on coronavirus and other viruses from a lot of different angles, that if you're able to show that picture to a cell biologist, for instance, and they're able to really get their head around how that spike works, then maybe that will help them understand something else, right? Even if it's not for a general audience. Definitely, definitely. Actually, all of this work that we're doing is in collaboration with other scientists and scientific groups that are tackling coronavirus from, from different angles. So if my lab focuses on these really, really small details of how how these spike things look, right? We're also working a lab that works on antibodies, which you might have heard about. Another lab, lab that's looking at it from the point of this is how coronavirus gets into the cells. And so all of us are communicating and giving, giving each other the new info that we've learned. Um, and that's, that's really, really important that scientists from a bunch of different backgrounds can come together and communicate with one another, just like how it's important for a science illustrator to be able to take the scientific understanding that we know and bring it out to the rest of us. Awesome. And I guess sort of bringing us full circle with the idea of the coronavirus pandemic and the general public. So can you talk a little bit about how science illustration can help us understand the pandemic, especially for a general audience? I muted myself there. Yeah, so this is a, a point in time where something that has a scientific nature is really, really affecting all of us on a very deep level, right? And all of a sudden, all of us out here in, in the public world are being surrounded by phrases that have a lot of scientific meaning ingrained into them, whose meaning doesn't come clearly to us, right? So I talked a little bit about flattening the curve in, in my talk, but you could also think about this if, if you've got some really science-minded journalists and they're talking about like R0 or R0, which is how um, we can describe how infectious the disease is, um, there are a lot of these scientific terms that allow us to describe why coronavirus is a big deal or how we can help prevent coronavirus from infecting our communities. And just saying words to people can get you a certain way, right? It, it's useful for us to have talks like these, um, but if you have a really good science illustration, you can potentially communicate a lot more than you can with words. And you can do it quickly, right? You can just get somebody's attention. They can be like, oh, okay, I understand that more than I did before. And when we need everybody in society to kind of come together and act a certain way in order to help prevent a pandemic like this from infecting and killing a whole bunch of us, having really good methods of communication is absolutely vital. All right. Well, thanks again to uh, Matt and Chris. You guys had fantastic talks, and I know the students were super excited about them. And so we look forward to seeing everybody next time for our next week of Exploring Science. Thanks. Thanks, thanks for having us.